Well, good morning. I'm recording here from my office because I messed up and didn't turn the camera on this morning. So we'll give you this same message, much more like the way I wrote it rather than the way I presented it on Sunday. We're using 2 Samuel chapter 15, uh, verse 26 and 25 and 26 for reference this morning. But today I want to challenge us to keep looking, you know, for what King David, how he can guide us uh, to be better Christians, to be better children of God, maybe to find God and uh, what, whatever, realizing that, uh, you know, he's got a great example in many ways and he can show us what a man after God's own heart looks like. So if you're a man or a woman, we can be challenged through this. Consider this statement. Plans are great but reality is greater. Life rarely goes as we plan it, and that's just the way it is for all of us, me more than most. But, but sometimes and that's because of our actions, and sometimes that's because of other actions. But the reality is that uh, the only really true thing we can see in this is that with hindsight, um, we can see that some of our dreams won't or can't come true, shouldn't have come true. Uh, sometimes we pray for things that are, uh, to us, seem logical and in God's will, but they're not. Sometimes we plan for things that are not in God's will. Not necessarily wrong or sinful things, just things that are not in His will. And, and as time carries on, we see that. And um, His plan's always better than ours. Um, I was watching a TV series called Manifest that demonstrated a concept that's very true in this, and, and it's a reality. It's, it's a fictional series about a, an airplane, a commercial aircraft, that takes off, and when it lands, uh, the, people, the passengers find out that they've been gone for five and a half years. Somehow they flew into a time warp, and it was a normal flight for them, but for everyone else, it took five and a half years for that plane to come back down. Now, it focuses on a family, a husband and wife with two kids, they're twins, uh, a boy and a girl, and they're on a vacation at a desert isle, and, uh, or at a beautiful island, some way, tropical island. And um, when they get ready to go home, the father changes their plans and puts himself and the boy, the young boy, on one plane, and then the, the wife and the daughter, they take their scheduled flight home. And they both leave the airport, and um, turns out that the, the father and the son were on this flight that was uh, somehow delayed in this time warp five and a half years. So the movie centers on this wife who is very embittered towards her husband for changing their plans. Uh, turns out their son um, was in the last stages of a cancer. The doctors had given him only six more months to live. One of the reasons why this vacation took place. And she felt like her husband robbed her of uh, their son's last six months by changing their plans on this. Um, so she was very embittered towards him. And, and when they come home, that that bitterness comes out, and uh, she she's having a hard time getting over it. Well, as it turns out, during the five and a half years that she was bitter every day, day after day, um, science advanced, and a cure for the type of cancer this young boy had became available. And so... Uh, he, he tried that experimental uh, procedure and he was cured completely and boy had a long life to look forward to. So as it turned out, you know, the wife had to apologize to her husband because of his decision to take himself and his son on this other airplane and change that. Uh, it saved the boy's life. And, uh, and all she knew was for five and a half years she had been very bitter about that. So, you know, this relates 
to a lot of people and their experiences with God. You know, in their perspective on how things are going or the way they prayed or, you know, a loved one dies or something, you can't possibly explain anything good on it. Uh, they get in better with God. Uh, God, who knows the whole picture, who knows um, thousands of years from now and the consequences of every action, you know, versus us with our knowledge of the little we can see, and we get mad at God because he didn't do the right thing or he didn't listen to our prayers or he didn't do what was right. God may have had nothing to do with it or he may have orchestrated those very events to be able to do something great and grand and grandiose down the road, even through difficulties and struggles and tough situations. And that's the reality. The bottom line is life rarely goes as we plan it. And sometimes that's because of our actions. Sometimes it's because of others' actions. And there's it's just the way it is. There is a reality that uh, hindsight can help us see that. Uh, some of our dreams just won't or shouldn't come true. Plans are great, but reality is greater. There are times when to us it appears that something else, somebody else received the blessings that we prayed for, that we prayed for someone else, and, and uh, our answered prayers go unanswered. Well, let's consider King David's final years of his life and how things weren't going the way he planned it, and yet how to respond when things are that way. We're looking at David's life now when he's in his 50s, and uh, he's been a king for, the king, for 22 years now. And as we remember from last week, it took him nearly 20 years to become king after he'd been anointed king by Samuel. Well, he's... They come to that time of year when it's time to go off to war again. Seems like what they do. And um, and David decided not to go this time. He was going to stay home. He was either feeling a little lazy or feeling a little tired or feeling a little old. <laughs> Whatever. He, he stayed around the palace. Probably got a little bored. Was hanging out on the roof looking down on the city below him. And what did he see? But his good friend Uriah's house. And on the roof of that house was... Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, a beautiful woman who was bathing in some way. Well, he ends up sending for her and spends a few nights with her, and she gets pregnant. And how they find that out that quick is a mystery, but time is always a variable in this. But the bottom line is he knows, and so he starts to cover his tracks. So he sends message to his general, um, Joab, to send Uriah home. Send him home. He needs a vacation. He needs a break, you know, and so he does, and he sends him home, and he, um, you know, is grateful to David, but struggles with why he got to come home, and anyway, he didn't go home to Bathsheba that night. He felt guilty because, um, you know, his buddies were sleeping in the mud and getting ready to go to battle and some would be injured or die that next day. And here he was. He felt like, I can't go home to my comforts of my wife when my friends are where they are. So he sleeps outside the palace on the ground. The next day, David finds out about that and modifies his plan. So he, um, he gets Uriah drunk. And then sends him home to Bathsheba, figuring, well, this will do the trick. And um, nothing changed with Uriah. He, he was steadfast, and he, he was not going home for a reason that he felt was justifiable. So he stayed in the dirt outside the palace again. So David changes his strategy altogether. He sends um, Uriah back to war with a message for Joab the general to put Uriah in the front of the fiercest battle and then pull back his support so he's out there by himself. A, a, a guaranteed death sentence. And that's exactly what happens. And uh, word comes back that Uriah died in a 
magnificent battle. And David becomes the hero because he decides to take in this uh, fallen soldier, this hero's wife and pregnant wife, and he takes her into his, the palace and cares for them both. <sighs> kind of a sad story, you know, that David twisted all this here. He did something bad and then he followed it up with something worse. And we talked about that a couple of weeks ago. Some of the bad decisions we make after, you know, we've made after we've sinned. So Nathan, the, the man of God, the prophet at that time, uh, God sends him to talk with David. And we read about this in 2 Samuel chapter 12, where it says, The Lord sent Nathan to David, and when he came to him, he said, There were two men in a certain town, one rich and the other poor, and the rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb he had bought. He raised it, and it grew up with him and his children, and it shared his food, and it drank from his cup, and it even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveler came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveler who had come to him, and instead he took the ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, As surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that land four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, You are that man. David responded to Nathan by saying, I have sinned against the Lord. Here we see David's heart after God. He, um, he had done some horrible things. And uh, horrible, you know, murder and, and, and um, adultery and, and hiding this and lying. But David always demonstrated and believed there was a God above him. He was the king. He could do anything he wanted. And really, there was, he had no accountability for those actions. He could just do them. Being the king, he had the right to do what he wanted, and he wouldn't be accountable to any men. But, um, but he immediately, he knew God was above him, and he did what was sin against, against the Lord. So he owned up to it, fessed up to it, he admitted it. Nathan told David that the Lord had taken away his sin, or that... Or, or that if he hadn't, David would have died in his sin. But not only would the son David that he had conceived with Bathsheba here, not only would that son die, but that the sword shall never leave David's house. He said, David, you're going to have consequences the rest of your days because of this action. Now we skip forward 10 years. Then David's number one son uh, from a different woman, not from Bathsheba, is called Amnon, and he's getting old enough uh, to start struggling with handling his hormones, and uh, he starts lusting after his half-sister, Tamar, and he ends up raping her because he tried to get her to lay with him, and she wasn't about to have anything of that, so um, unfortunately, or fortunately, however it works out, when you live in a palace, when you're the king's kids and family, you have uh, servants all around all the time. So nothing goes on there in secret. And there's not known about. There's always eyes or ears listening. And so David hears about Amnon's uh, rape of Tamar. And uh, when he hears about it, he, he does nothing. He doesn't respond to it at all. So Tamar's brother is furious about that. But he's also very patient. He's a strategizer. He, uh, so he, he figures he'll take care of Tamar. And he waits for a while. And then when he thinks that the whole Tamar Amnon rape thing is forgotten or most people aren't focused on anymore, then Absalom, um, this son, he, he holds a big party. And at that party, uh, he kills Amnon 
uh, for raping Tamar. And David hears about this through his servants and does nothing. It's going to be a big question I'll hope to ask David someday or ask God is uh, if, you know, if David had responded, you know, to, to Amnon when he raped Tamar and and of you know confronted him punished him some way you know let him know uh, would his other son Absalom have been a murderer you know I, I don't think so I think he was trying to take justice into his own hands and there was no justice in this circumstance so he did it I don't know but what we do know is that David knew he was going to have long-term negative consequences because of his actions with Bathsheba. And if that's the reason why he did nothing, if he assumed that all this negative uh, actions was part of his consequences, then that could explain why he, he didn't punish his own children. Though he didn't help them, um, didn't help them in a lot of ways. I don't know. Eventually, um, Absalom wants a relationship with David, pursues a relationship with David. And, um, and David doesn't want anything to do with it. David knows Absalom, Absalom is a murderer of his brother. So, uh, so Absalom, you know, he's, he's struggling out there and he's fighting it. And, you know, um, David's number one general, Joab, he, he sees this. And he's a good counselor of David. And so he goes to him and he says, hey, you know, he actually he goes to another woman and he kind of pulls a Nathan with her in that he tells this woman, go to David and say this and, and tell him the story so that, you know, he gets upset with the circumstances of what's that. And then at the end, tell him, you're that man, David. You're the one that's not being a good father. And... Um, and this woman does that, and Joab was right. David responds, and he chooses to, uh, to meet with Absalom and develop him, but he can't maintain it. That was really the only time, and then he shuns Absalom again. So Absalom is really uh, frustrated with David now, and just something turns within him, and he just starts strategizing to uh, not gain his father's favor to become the king, but to uh, take it from him. And so he, he starts a five-year strategy where he gets a big portion of the army uh, behind him. And, um, and then he's ready to, to go after David. Now David, you know, by this point, David's in his 60s. And he, he's, you know, too old to be out fighting. And, and uh, he doesn't want to be fighting his son. He doesn't want to be a fugitive either but his son's coming after him and there's going to be a battle and David's going to have to fight for his life and the truth is all of Absalom's soldiers are going to be fighting all of David's loyal soldiers and it's going to be a bloody mess and David doesn't want that so he decides he's going to leave Jerusalem he's going to leave his precious city that he's given and he's going to give it up to Absalom. He's going to give the throne to Absalom and um, he's going to save lives out of it. So he just prepares to leave town. So as David and his loyal soldiers do that, the high priest Zadok you know, gathers up some of the priests and the Ark of the Covenant and, so, and they plan on leaving with David and they jump in and start uh, going with them. Of course, you know, this ark represents the presence of God. It represents God. And so David realizes that if he lets the ark come with him, that um, his son's coming after him for sure because he's got to get that back. Or, you know, that's a symbolic thing of David still in charge is God is, God is with him. So he um, he tells his, his priests not to leave, but to return to the city. And I think once again, David realizes that all this is because of his actions, not, not because of Absalom's necessarily. So David doesn't want to make it worse. 
but giving up the city, giving up his throne doesn't solve the problem with Absalom. He takes all that and then strategizes and plans and gets his army ready to go after David. Well, this scripture we're using today is um, David responding to the priest when, um, when the priest is bringing him out of the city. And, um, and that's where, where we read in 2 Samuel. Um, then the king said to Zadok, take the ark of God back into the city. And if I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it again and dwell in his dwelling place again. But if he says, I'm not pleased with you, then I am ready to let him do to me whatever seems good to him. This is where David's heart, heart after God comes out again. He's, he's the king. He can do whatever he wants. One of his sons is trying to kill him and take over his throne. And David says, take it. You know, this is not what I want. This is not how I wanted my life to end. This is not what I wanted to do. But God's will be done. I am not going to fight my own son to keep the throne or to keep the city. God's will be done in this. I won't fight my own son. So David sends the ark back into the city. Absalom, you know, comes in with his soldiers, takes the city, takes the throne, takes the ark, and then still pursues David. So David can run no more. They're, they're stuck. They're in the, in the mountain passes. They're, they're getting surrounded. There's many times more soldiers coming against him with Absalom than he has with him. So he goes to his, his number one general, Joab, and he says, hey, you know, the fight's coming. We can't stop it. We're going to have to fight. Um... I don't want you know all of my all of you guys to be sacrificed, so we'll, we'll fight. But on the other hand, be gentle with Absalom. Don't hurt him. This is not his fault. So David's men were highly outnumbered, um, but then David's men slaughtered Absalom's army. It was a slaughter for God's hand was definitely demonstrated in this and David's been took on the vast numbers and took them out and uh, and Joab he he makes the tough call he does what what David cannot and he realizes as long as Absalom's alive this is going to be a problem so he kills Absalom himself quickly mercilessly I mean mercifully and um just takes away the problem. Well, with all of David's flaws and weaknesses, even during his brilliant careers and his victories, as well as here in these struggles and these difficulties, he was always confident that God was his king. And, you know, maybe he didn't know the right thing to do a lot of times. Maybe he didn't do the right thing a lot of times. But he always recognized God as his king and that he knew, you know, what was going on. So my takeaway on this, my big point is, where's your foundation? You know, in what do you found your faith? What is the foundation of your faith? David, the foundation of his faith was God, Lord God. He had all faith in God. What's yours? Because it's huge. You better... It better not be in something other than God. It better not be in a fairy tale ending to your life. Because, as most of us see, you know, plans are great, but life is greater. It doesn't work out the way we thought. You know, if you put your faith in your retirement, if you're putting your faith in the stock market, if you're the foundation of your faith is your investments, where you live, your location on the coast, in California, in America, hey, guess what? All those are going to let you down. If you're trusting, if your foundation of your faith is how well this place is run or, or you know, if, if they keep it up to your standards, um, you're going to be disappointed. What is the foundation of your faith. Consider if the foundation of your faith is 
even if it's in your answered prayers, if the foundation of your faith is God answering your prayers, what are you going to do when your prayers are not God's will? And that happens for all of us. Some of you are way more godly than me. Some of you are, are know the heart of God and pray effectively and see miracles and all this. But if you're honest, you look back at your prayers and you've prayed for many things that God didn't answer. And over time, you recognize there was a reason why he didn't answer it. He didn't want that to be. If your faith, if the foundation of your faith is God answering your prayers, you're on slippery ground. It's always a mistake to wrap you know, your confidence in God around your dreams or your prayers or your concept of how things should be. David's heart after God showed that in the midst of terrible circumstances that no one would want, especially not David, when his own kids were coming after him to kill him, David's prayer was, David's actions were, and his prayers, if I find favor with God and he'll bring me back, I will not raise my hand and do wrong against my own son. I won't, I won't fight him. God, you work it out. God did. He worked it out through Joab. <laughs> the godly man and wise counselor of David's who saw him through a lot of his issues. Not my will, but yours be done, David says. That's my challenge to you. Make sure your foundation is in God. And then pray, plan, work with all of your knowledge and all of your heart, but put your foundation and trust in God, no matter how the circumstances work out, no matter how the battle that you're in ends. If battle after battle you fail, even though you prayed for God to help, remember, we win in the end. God wins in the end. But all of what he does to get us there is God's will. So we trust in him. God bless you.